Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, Florida residents are preparing for Hurricane Milton. The campus community remembers the lost lives in Israel. And the university's chancellor is proposing a new plan for football. All that plus your weather in orange sports right now on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Good morning, I'm Autumn Ryan. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Mikey Lamar. Here's a look at today's top story. We start this morning with some breaking news. Hurricane Milton is on track to make landfall on Florida's Gulf Coast tonight as a Category 4 storm. The current storm is on its way to Sarasota, just south of Tampa Bay. More than 1,600 gas stations in Florida have ran out of fuel as residents try to evacuate. Officials say that the state supply is falling due to panic buying and drivers topping off their tanks, which can make shortages worse. Here's the Hillsborough County Sheriff with how the state is responding. Why gamble? Why would you gamble with your life or the lives of your loved ones? Get out, even if it's outside the evacuation area to a hotel, to a friend's house. We know it's an inconvenience. We know you're going to be uncomfortable, but you'll be alive. Our weather anchor Nico Horning joins us now to break down the path of this storm. Nico? All right, guys. Well, you just heard it. Over 200 lives were lost a couple of weeks ago in Hurricane Helene. And now a look at Hurricane Milton. Look at this big glob of rain and wind circulating in the Gulf of Mexico, expected to hit that central part of the state of Florida very soon. We get a look at the track of the hurricane and the progression that could be upcoming. It's a category four hurricane right now. It decreased from a five to a four overnight, expected to make landfall in the next, into that central part of Florida into the day tomorrow. Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg, um, Sarasota, all affected. Look at the wind gusts, though, 130 miles an hour, not to mention the storm surge that is coming up as well. Nine to 15 feet of uh, storm surge where that could be making a huge impact on the beaches and a lot of localized flooding as well. So that's with Hurricane Milton. We'll have a little, more, little bit more of an update coming up on that a little bit later on. But here in Syracuse, it's a 50 degree day right now. And uh, as you can see, pretty cloudy overall, maybe some light rain expected this evening, but that's all I have in weather right now. Some sun potentially coming up a little bit later in the week. I'll have that more for you guys a little bit later on. So Mikey, I know you're from Florida, so what are you thinking about this hurricane coming? Yeah, although I'm in Syracuse right now, I got a lot of family and friends back home, and usually we're not worried about hurricanes because they come so often, but you know, there's some weariness with this one up ahead, so I think we'll, they'll be all right. I think Florida will be all right for the most part, though. So, yeah. Moving to local news, the Department of Public Safety is investigating a bias incident on SU's campus. An unidentified man allegedly yelled a homophobic slur at two students walking past the Barnes Center at the Arch around 1 a.m. on Saturday morning. DPS Chief Craig Stone says they are focused on supporting the students impacted and identifying the individual responsible. They have not determined whether or not the suspect is connected to Syracuse University. Monday marked one year since the terrorist group Hamas attacked Israel. Syracuse's Hillel and Shabbat SU held a remembrance vigil on the steps of Hendricks Chapel. Our Max Williams joins us live with the recap of this event. Max? Hey, good morning, guys. Well, right here behind me is where that visual took place. There was a whole group of Jewish students here remembering the lives lost in the Israel-Hamas war, which only began a year ago on Monday. It was mainly peaceful here, but that wasn't the same for other college campuses. Protests erupting again on Columbia University's campus. This video showing pro-Palestinian protesters surrounding Jewish students as they try to remember the lives lost in the Israel-Hamas war one year ago this week. On Syracuse University's campus, everything remained calm with Jewish students remembering the anniversary with a visual at Hendrick Chapel. It's a very tense and uh, stressful situation where, where most Israelis feel like uh, kind of deja vu. 
Ethan Baer, rabbi of the Hillel Jewish Center at the university, was one of the members running the vigil. There's very little institutional infrastructure left, hospitals or universities. War is always heartbreaking, um, even, if, even if it's necessary. Over in the Middle East, 41,788 people in Gaza have been killed, with 96,700 injured. And in Israel, 1,200 people have been killed, with about 8,700 injured. With the presidential election just around the corner, Barr's message to the American people is to choose wisely. It's important to, to both create space for, um, for the Jewish community to come together and to grieve. <laughs> A wish that will hopefully bring us all back together as one again. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Max Williams. And former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris both attended events commemorating the, the attacks uh, that took place again one year ago on Monday. Uh, but for now, live, live from Hendrick Chapel, Max Williams. Thank you, Max. Within less than a week, a double stabbing and a homicide have been reported in Syracuse. And now public concerns are still being raised after the city police department released this weekly crime report last night. Our Mike Lamort spoke with SPD on how it plans to tackle the issue of rising crime in Syracuse. Locals today raising concerns after reports of increased homicide and rape crimes throughout the city. I don't feel safe. I always go out with someone if I'm going out at night. I'm nervous about it. Homicide has increased in the 315 more than 17 percent this year, with rape increasing nearly 3 percent. It's always concerning when we see, start to see trends like that, so we start to identify where these incidents are happening. We'll try to target problem areas that we're seeing. And while crimes like rape and homicide are on the rise right here in the 315, the Syracuse Police Department says calls coming in to report these crimes are on the decline. The amount of phones to service has decreased over 2% from last year, equating to about 1,000 less 911 calls. Well, one Syracuse resident believes it's a result of people just not wanting to wait for the police to show up. The people don't call because they're going to take two hours to get there. By that time, he could be dead. <laughs> But the SPD says the limited number of available officers has caused response times to be based on priority levels. We have priority one, priority two, and priority three calls. We want to target priority one calls first and foremost, so that's like any violent crimes, shootings, stabbings, etc. Still with the rise in homicide and rape crimes in Syracuse, students and locals are wondering whether they can trust the police when determining priority levels. Do, do you trust the police? Um... As a whole, no. I think I would, you know, I would call 911 if I had to. Um, but, like, I think there needs to be major changes. I certainly trust them and, and, and value them and uh, ad admire them. I think it's kind of sad, you know, we, we created this system that's supposed to protect people. But in recent years, it's just resulted in a lot of, like, distrust. It's like, you know, if I call the police, will they actually do anything to help me or will they just make it worse? A new crime report is expected to be released by Wednesday of next week. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Mike Lamort. Thanks, Mike. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, thousands of fans headed to the GMA Dome this weekend to see pop star Pink, which led to quite a few traffic problems. How Syracuse is addressing the issue after the break. Now it's time to check your weather for today. Nico Horning is live with a look at your full weather forecast. Well, the sun's breaking out a little bit out here. There's some blue sky to my right, but those blue skies aren't expected to last for too long. It'll be cloudy for the majority of the day and even some rain tonight. As you can see, 51 degrees right now here in Syracuse. Pretty light winds all around, but definitely more mild than what we saw a couple of weeks ago. So again, some rain tonight in the evening. A look at tomorrow, mostly cloudy throughout the day. Again, those temperatures staying pretty low in the low 50s. So definitely bring a jacket, probably transitioning from shorts to pants nowadays and maybe a glimpse of sun in the evening tomorrow night. As we get a look at your five day forecast, uh, again, a little bit of rain this evening, tomorrow that cooling 54 degrees, and then into the weekend, it should be a fairly decent weekend. Some sun breaking out, a little bit warmer temperatures as we hit into the 60s, and then by the time the end of the weekend hits, some rain as well on Sunday. That could produce a little bit of wet here in central New York. But for now, that's all in weather. Back to you guys. Thank you. With big concerts come big traffic problems. 
Our Nate Cunningham is in studio with how Syracuse is responding to an increase in traffic complaints. Thanks, Mikey. This weekend, the JMA Wireless Dome was filled with nearly 40,000 people screaming for pink. The pop star came in with high flying flips, tricks, and a stunning performance that some described to be, quote, the greatest show of all time in dome history. While the action inside JMA was outstanding, the action outside was lackluster at best. With construction on Interstate 81 already slowing down travelers, an influx of attendees pushed people back miles. A primary issue that Syracuse Police Chief Rich Schaff said is that it all starts with navigation tools. Apps like Waze or Google Maps often tend to take visitors directly to the dome. People will then have to travel to the closest parking lot, which are often filled up upon arrival. It then becomes a frenzy to find the closest parking lot near campus. On the flip side, if you're lucky enough to nab a parking spot pass spot prior to the concert date, the directions to the lot on SU's website are often misleading. Instead of having up to date interactive map like the one that they have for students on campus, they have an out of scale PDF with text directions that most people in 2024 just simply don't understand. On top of that, the concept of trolleys and shuttles from various locations around the city mean people can be waiting for hours just to get within walking distance of the dome. So how do you fix this frustrating issue? Well, there isn't really a clear answer. Let's take a look at all the lots Syracuse University has for parking. Given the fact Syracuse has nine surface lots at an average of 200 spots per lot, six garages which hold upward of 900 spots, three perimeter lots which can hold on average 500, and Skytop lot which houses nearly 1,200 spots, and that's all per SU's website. There are approximately 9,000 available parking spots on campus for any given event. A study was done from 2016 to 2020 where SU hosted 173 events. For any type of athletic outing or concert, just brought 30,000 people, three-fourths of the dome capacity, it would attract over 13,000 cars to campus, and that doesn't include student and faculty cars already here. Despite the parking struggles, it doesn't mean that the dome will stop hosting events anytime soon. And with basketball season right around the corner, I know I've parked my spot right here in the studio, but Mikey, how about you? I got a secret spot. I'm not going to give all that out, but... Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, MLB playoffs are in full swing as the Mets brought home a big win last night. And the first ever face-off between Syracuse and UNLV happened this past weekend. We'll have your full sports report after the break. Welcome to Orange Sports. The Chancellor is stepping up as a starter to save college sports. Concerns about the future of intercollegiate sports, specifically what it means for Syracuse athletics. Yesterday, the Chancellor Kent Suvarud held a press call with local media to address a proposal for a college student football league, an alternative model to sports as we know it, that could replace what critics like Suvarud call an outdated model motivated by money and greed. Under this new model, the top 72 programs would compete in the Power 12 Conference, and the remaining 64 schools would compete in the second conference, the Group of Eight, with the chance to play up under circumstances. He outlines three benefits to this model. Let's take a look now. I think the, the league makes a lot of sense because it co would coordinate with the National College Student Football Players Association, which would be subject to agreements that would ensure competitive equity and take care of fair compensation across the board. And, and that would ensure fan interest in scheduling. The chancellor did say this wouldn't interfere with image and likeness of the players. While this plan is not drawing favor from everyone, it is important to note that this only affects college football for now. Will this proposal be a touchdown? Right now, we have an even rich kick kickoff. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Zatazia Duffy. Over the weekend, Syracuse football hit the road for the first time and traveled all the way to fabulous Las Vegas for a matchup against ranked UNLV. Cal McCord and the Orange jumped out to a two touchdown lead early with a pair of LeQuint Allen touchdowns, first a receiving touchdown, then a, a rushing touchdown just eight minutes later. The Rebels took the second quarter by storm with three touchdowns of their own. And we enter halftime with a 21-17 ball game. Now we jump to the fourth quarter. Game is tied. UNLV is driving. And Haj Malik Williams finds Ricky White the third over the middle to take the lead. Time is running out for the Orange. And it's third and goal. Cal McCord delivers to Jackson Meeks. And we get free football. 
In overtime, the Syracuse defense forced the Rebels to take a field goal, and the Orange have a chance to win it. In the first half, LaQuint Allen went to Coach Brown and said, Coach, the pain in my leg is at an 8 out of 10. He also said, I won't come out. LaQuint Allen put the Orange on his back and did whatever he could to score, running through a man. Syracuse knocks off 25-ranked UNLV for the second-ranked win of the season with Allen's walk-off touchdown. Just putting it all in line for my team. At the end of the day, if I can run, I can jog, you know, I still want to go out there for my team because nobody's bigger than the S. So. Not talking about just showing actions. I could say actions on and off the field, you know, just being a leader and just being leading by example and just putting it all in line for my teammates, you know. I would, I would die out there for my teammates if I could, but I just love my teammates. The NHL season kicked off last night for six teams taking the ice, and there was plenty of reasons to celebrate across the league. In Seattle, the Kraken hosted the St. Louis Blues. All the action unfolded in the second period. The Kraken defenseman Vince Dunn fired a shot past the Blues goaltender just 20 seconds into the second, giving Seattle an early 1-0 lead. Moments later, Eli Tavolin doubled Seattle's score. The Blues fired three goals in a row to come back, securing a 3-2 lead. Despite the strong start, Seattle couldn't recover. While the Kraken fell short, they made history in a different way. Jessica Campbell was behind the bench as an assistant coach for Seattle. Campbell was previously the assistant coach for the AHL affili affiliate of the Kraken, the Coachella Valley Firebirds. After Dan Bilsma was named head coach of the Kraken, he brought Campbell up to the NHL, becoming the first woman to coach in an NHL game ever. Meanwhile, in Florida, the reigning Stanley Cup champions, the Florida Panthers, opened their season at home against the Boston Bruins. The night began with the Panthers raising their first ever championship banner. Florida finally captured the Stanley Cup last season, and the Panthers carried the momentum into the game, dominating the Bruins in a 6-2 victory. Another milestone came out west where the professional hockey made its debut in Utah. Jazz forward Lori Markennan, owner of the team, dropped the first puck before Utah took the ice to face the Chicago Blackhawks in their inaugural NHL game. Dylan Gunther made history early in the first period with the first ever goal in Utah's franchise. Tuvo Tervani and Nick Foligno both scored for the Blackhawks. The game ended at 5-2 for the Utah Hockey Club. Definitely a memorable moment for the players and fans. Action continues tonight. More teams opening their season, including a matchup between the New York Rangers and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now we go to the MLB playoffs. So all four teams went into this uh, series tied. Okay, yeah, that's the first time in history that all four series in the divisional round has gone after two games and is tied. Uh, we saw the Mets last night pull a win out to take the series lead 2-1 over the Phillies. And on the West Coast, we saw the Padres do the same thing against the Dodgers. Yeah, I mean, they were all on fire. One specific, in particular, Fernando Tatis Jr. He was on fire. Yeah, Fernando Tatis Jr. has been putting up video game numbers, and I mean that literally. He's hitting 500 at the plate, and his on-base plus slugging is out of this world at a 1988. That's third all-time in postseason rankings behind Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. Tonight, we've got all four games in baseball lined up on the docket, but we'll head over back to the anchor desk with Autumn and Mikey. Thanks. Next up on Mornings on the Hill, Vice President Kamala Harris has been on a media frenzy with less than a month into the election. And a new Joker movie hits theaters and didn't have the reaction many expected. We'll have your full entertainment report after the break. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. I'm Benaya Johnson with our top entertainment headlines of the week. Two-time Grammy Award winning artist Sissy Houston died at the age of 91. On Monday morning, Sissy died from Alzheimer's disease in New Jersey while under hospice care. She was surrounded by her family in her final moments. Two-time Grammy Award winning artist Sissy Houston died at the age of 91. On Monday morning, Sissy died from Alzheimer's disease in New Jersey while under hospice care. She was surrounded by family in her final moments. 
It's funny that you should say that because exactly. Uh, to have worked so long, I've been singing for, since I was five years old. And now uh, I won in 1997 and here again in 1999. It's just wonderful. It's just wonderful to know that somebody is listening to what I'm saying, finally. <laughs> Thank you. The Daddy Gang stepped into the political ring on Sunday, where podcast host Alex Cooper sat down with Kamala Harris on her Call Me Daddy podcast. They both engaged in a discussion about the most relevant issues pertaining to women, including reproductive rights and personal tax made from her opponents. The vice president responds to statements made by Ohio State Senator J.D. Vance about childless cat ladies. I think that most Americans want leaders who understand that the measure of their strength is not based on who you beat down. The real measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up. The bar fell lower than expected for DC fans. Joker 2 got off to a worse than expected start at the box office on opening weekend. The Joker sequel failed to impress moviegoers with a 31% Rotten Tomato score. This rating is the worst ever for a comic book movie when I first saw Joker, when I saw you. The whole with you. For once in my life, I didn't feel so alone anymore. Luke Combs and Eric Church team up for a concert for Carolina. North Carolina residents, recently affected by Hurricane Helene, will be getting a kick of country music on October 26. Due to these tragic events, all proceeds made from the concert will go to impacted families. When I wrote this song, I didn't envision a, or envision the scenario for this song. Um, I had already written the song. I was in the studio for a project next year. And then Hurricane Helene happened in Western North Carolina and the devastation there. And there's a line in this song that says, in your darkest hour, I'll come run it. And that's what the people there need right now. They need us to come run it. And that will do it for our entertainment report. Autumn and Mikey, back to you. That's all from us on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Autumn Ryan. I'm Mikey Lamar. Thanks for watching, Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday.